ordered, please, could I ask members and guests who are leaving the gallery to do so quietly, please? This Parliament is still in session. The next item of business today is the Members' Business Debate on Motion Number 11325 in the name of John Mason on Equal Pay. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would be grateful if those members who wish to speak in the debate could press the request to speak buttons now. I call on John Mason to open the debate. Seven minutes, please, Mr Mason. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and thank you also, uh, can I say, to members uh, who signed this motion to allow deba uh, today's debate to go ahead, uh, which I think specifically includes Neil Finlay, um, John Finney, who is not well, and Jean Urquhart. Um, we should perhaps start by noting that the figures in the motion are now slightly out of date. Uh, the statutory minimum wage is £6.50, but the living wage uh, has increased now to £7.85, as I think of the 3rd of November, uh, whereas it was £7.65 in October uh, when I actually wrote this motion. Now, I would like to make uh, three main points uh, in the debate today. And the first one is that the voluntary living wage is good. I first really became familiar with the concept of the living wage while I was in London, where there is a very active campaign to expand it. And the gap there between uh, the living wage and the statutory minimum wage is even wider, with the living wage in London currently being £9.15. The Living Wage Foundation tells us that there are over 1,000 employers throughout the UK signed up to the living wage, uh, with 70 of these, I think, being in Scotland. And I'm sure there are other employers, including myself, I have to say, eh, who are paying the living wage but have not formally signed up eh, to the campaign. However, they also tell us that in the UK, 5.28 million workers are being paid less than the living wage, of which some 400,000 of these are in Scotland. And of these, 150,000 in Scotland are actually on the minimum wage. Many of these employees are in the retail sector, catering, and the care sector. I wonder if the uh, member would allow me. Uh, absolutely. The, Alex uh, Salmond. Uh, as, uh, as the member knows, the uh, support of the Scottish Government in 2011 for the public sector and the living wage was crucially important, something that wasn't managed in the previous uh, years of Labour administration. Uh, and also large companies in Scotland like SSE and Abelio signing up for the living wage is crucial. But would you particularly welcome this morning the latest signature to the living wage, a small company in rural Aberdeenshire, keen on recycling near New Deer, who signed up this morning to the living wage campaign. And isn't it particularly important when smaller employers in Scotland sign up to this incredibly crucial campaign? John Mason. Y yes, I think it absolutely uh, I do welcome that. And uh, I was going to say later on, but I'll say it now, that uh, there's a huge benefit for a company. It says a lot about the company. It says a lot about their social responsibility, that they've got a conscience. Well, let me just finish just what I was going to say. Uh, they've got a conscience. Uh, obviously, there are economic factors. They've got to be able to pay it. Uh, but I think it is very positive if a company makes that commitment. Neil Finlay. Uh, he mentioned the care sector, which is one of the sectors where there are real problems with low pay. And isn't, uh, does he agree with me that one of the main issues there is the way in which local authority budgets have been driven down and that contracts externalised end up being based on competition on price rather than the quality of service being paid Therefore, the only place largely to take the money from to get that price down is the workers who deliver the service, which is increasingly a poor service. John Mason, I will reimburse your time for the interventions. Uh, that's very generous. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I mean, I, I broadly agree on, I think, the point that's being made. I certainly am not happy with the outsourcing that has been going on in councils like Glasgow, eh, and that has been a way of getting round proper pay and conditions, eh, which eh, I think a lot of councils seek to eh, adhere to. But the key factor in all of this, no, 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 I'm sorry, not again. The key factor, the member can make a speech if he wants. The key factor is that employers should be paying their employees enough to live on. Now, there is something very far wrong that someone is working full time and cannot actually live on that. So that wage or salary has to be topped up with tax credits or other benefits. Now, I do very much welcome that system of tax credits, which tops up those wages to a, a level that folk can live on. That is good for the individual, good for the family, obviously. But they are effectively a subsidy by the state to employers who, for whatever reason, do not pay a proper wage. And, of course, it also holds good that if employers pay a living wage, the state would save the money currently used for tax credits, and that could be used for other purposes. 
There are also, also, as I said, business benefits to paying the living wage, including a higher retention of employees and better productivity. So my first point was the voluntary living wage is good. But my second point is what is wrong with the voluntary living wage? Well, the main problem is that it is voluntary. We as a parliament, government, individual MSPs can all make sure that we pay it. And other parts of the public sector very often pay it, the voluntary sector. And we can encourage other employers to pay it as well. Now, at this stage, I would like to mention James Kelly's amendment to my motion, eh, which seeks to help workers on public sector contracts. Government advice is that that is not within our legal powers, and my colleague eh, Nigel Dawn will touch on this later, I think, when he speaks. But obviously, if we can expand the use of the living wage, I absolutely welcome that. But the underlying problem still is that the living wage is voluntary. It only helps workers in the public sector or on public sector contracts. So we are... So are we just going to give up on all the other workers? What about the workers in the private sector and the voluntary sector? Do we not care about them? Problems are also created if one employer pays the living wage and another does not. The unethical employer will be able to undercut the ethical one, which I think was one of the points uh, Mr Finlay was making. And it can make the public sector look artificially expensive when compared to much of the private sector. So the living wage, I would argue, is only a halfway house a stepping stone to something better. So my third point is the real answer is the statutory minimum wage. Now, to give credit where it is due, Labour did do well to introduce the statutory minimum wage for the whole of the UK at Westminster. I remember before that that security staff in, in the East End of Glasgow, certainly, were paid a pound an hour. And even allowing for inflation, that was totally exploitation. However, while that statutory minimum wage was a good start, it always needed to be increased by more than just wage inflation. In order to get to a decent level, i.e. the living wage, sadly successive Labour and Conservative governments at Westminster failed to do this. At the time it was introduced, I accept there was a lot of scaremongering from some employers that it would lead to huge loss of jobs. And that has not proved to be the case. And so the argument for that low introductory rate for the statutory minimum wage is no longer there. The thing that disappoints me most about James Kelly's amendment is that it drops the statement from my original motion, quote, the UK national minimum wage of 6.50 per hour is too low, unquote. I would be delighted to hear from any of Mr Kelly's colleagues, as I think he is not here uh, today himself, um, that a future Labour government at Westminster would bring the statutory minimum wage up to the full 7.85 as quickly as possible. I guess, to be fair, I would also like to hear from the Scottish government that if the SNP was ever to support a minority UK government, then increasing the statutory minimum wage would be a priority. I have to say I was very disappointed that the Smith Commission report at paragraph 59 said that the national minimum wage should remain reserved. So my hope would still be that this power could be devolved, as I believe there would be an appetite here from at least two of the parties to take it higher than a Westminster government might do. Presiding officer, a range of other issues around this which we could touch on. Younger workers should be getting the same wage for the same job. Uh, should the level of the living wage be the same all around the country? But I will not go into these today. But I hope I have made my fundamental point clear. The voluntary living wage is a good thing, but it is always going to be second best. And the real answer has to be a proper statutory minimum wage. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call Neil Finlay to be followed by Gavin Brown. Thanks very much, President Officer. And uh, can I thank John Mason and congratulate him for bringing forward this motion. It's a very important uh, economic and social issue because poverty and low pay eats away at people. It puts strains on uh, family relationships, impacts on children's education, on nutrition, on well-being, happiness, and has a huge impact on the health of individuals, indeed whole communities. Uh, Dr Jerry McCartney, a public health expert, said recently that the policy that would most impact on health inequalities is the living wage. Putting money into the pockets of the lowest paid is the best way to reduce health inequality and it also stimulates the local economy. Can I can also say I, I agree with John Mason that the statutory minimum wage is far too low. In my own county of West Lothian, 16,000 people are earning less than the seven 85 living wage. 427,000 people across Scotland in the same position. And of course, we've witnessed the gap between the top earners and those at the bottom of the earnings scale widen. Under the coalition government, we see tax cuts 
for the rich and pay and benefit cuts for the low paid and the poor. We shouldn't be surprised by this, as this is central, of course, to the political ideology and ethos of Mr Brown and uh, Mr Fraser's party. Uh, and, of course, we still see the gender pay gap evident with women workers in Scotland earning around 17 per cent less than male colleagues. And only today we see the UK government naming and shaming. I'm surprised they did it, but they did it, and I congratulate them for it. 37 employers, including some in Scotland, who failed to pay the minimum wage, uh, including multinational fashion chain H&M, which claims to be an ethical uh, retailer, yet it won't pay the minimum wage to some of its staff. This is a company that in 2012 earned $400 million uh, uh, in one quarter, of profit in one quarter. Um, but, President Officer, across the Scottish body politic, we've all got responsibility for policy in this area. The UK government has responsibility for the national minimum wage. Scottish government responsibility for a whole host of policies, including spending of £10 billion in a, of a procurement budget, local government and many public agencies have responsibility for pay policy and contracting. All of these bodies can take decisions to increase the level of pay if they have the political will to do so. Can I say Mr Mason is wrong about Glasgow uh, City Council and Cordia because they do pay the living wage to their care staff and I think it would be good for him to correct that on the record. Um, for me it was unforgivable that when we had the opportunity in this parliament to use the powers we have to ensure that in public sector contracts all contractors paid the living wage, the government failed to do so. What a missed opportunity to improve the lives of people in Shettleston or in West Lothian and all across uh, Scotland. Uh, and under the Scottish Government's watch, we also see currently a dispute at the National Museum where the lowest paid workers, yes, they're paid the living wage, but who, uh, with the removal of weekend allowances, will lose £3,000 from their pay packet. This is a dispute that has gone on for a year. And I hope Mr Mason uh, agrees with me that the Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Cu Culture and External Affairs needs to resolve this dispute immediately. Yeah, gentlemen. Minister. Uh, issue. Uh, would uh, the member also then be calling on his colleagues in North Lanarkshire Council further to the ruling of the tribunal yesterday on the very, very, very long-standing equal pay uh, debacle not to proceed with an appeal so that these people who are entitled to the pay that they should have received years ago now get it? Yeah. Neil Finlay. I think equal pay claims should be settled as quickly as possible. I think that's a long-standing issue and we should get them uh, uh, settled as quickly as possible. It doesn't get us away from the fact that under the Scottish Government's watch, the lowest paid people in the museum service are going to lose £3,000 unless the Sec Cabinet Secretary for Culture gets her act together. President Officer, and this Parliament next week will be only too aware of the issues of pay policy when staff in this very building go on strike as part of a rolling programme of action by Scottish Government staff protesting against pay policy. Uh, we all have a role to play in addressing issues of low pay. No one and no party has a monopoly of compassion or interest in this issue. And I know Mr Mason is genuine in his concern, but low pay and poverty is not inevitable. It's up to all of us to work to eradicate it, but it takes political will and commitment to do so. Thank you. Now call Gavin Brown to be followed by Nigel Dawn. Thank you, President Officer. Can I start by congratulating uh, John Mason on securing this debate and of noting uh, his uh, consistency and him being persistent uh, in pursuing uh, this, issue, this issue. There are elements of his motion and uh, in particular elements of his speech uh, with which it's easy to agree and other elements where I disagree uh, and take a, a different view. In terms of where we agree, I think we're right to welcome the progress that has been made over the last couple of years, uh, and I'm prepared to acknowledge the efforts of the Scottish Government uh, in this regard, I think uh, government at other levels, um, and I think progress has been made and will continue uh, to be made. I think we should also acknowledge uh, improvements made by business. He gave the statistics, 1,000 employers across the UK, uh, and a percentage, I can't remember if he said 70 or 80, uh, within Scotland, um, but we welcome that too. And I think also we support any initiatives uh, to try and encourage improvement uh, in pay conditions. 
and indeed in driving the living wage forward. But we certainly prefer on this uh, side of the chamber more carrot than stick, and we think the voluntary approach uh, is preferred to us over any kind of uh, statutory approach. Uh, like John Mason, I'm also interested to hear what the government has to say to the question that he posed in closing, uh, where he said, will the Scottish government demand a statutory, statutory living wage um, in any negotiations or discussions? Because obviously in the white paper, there was no commitment to a statutory living wage. There was a commitment to increase the national minimum wage in line with inflation, uh, but there was nothing in terms of a statutory commitment towards a living wage. And I'm interested to hear if that position remains the same or if indeed it has changed uh, since the publication of the White Paper and indeed the referendum. Where I take a different view, where my party takes a different view uh, from Mr. Mason, is in actually making the living, living wage mandatory and statutory. Um, I look carefully at the reports laid by the Low, low Pay Commission uh, each year with the UK and think very carefully about what, what they have to say. First, I'd say, oh, that commission have to look at the um, effect it will have on low-paid workers, but also to attempt to work out what it will do to their employment prospects. So there is a balancing act to be performed by then. It's not just about trying to uh, improve their standard of living in terms of what they're paid. It's also looking at what the effect might be on jobs and the effect on employment prospects for those two. There is a balancing act to perform, uh, which I think the Low Pay Commission um, can do pretty effectively. It's important also to look at the makeup of the Low Pay Commission. It is not an employer's forum where only one side of the argument is put forward. I look at the current commissioners, or at least those who were involved in the most recent report, and there is a strong balance of employers, of members of trade unions, from local government, from academics, so that all factors, all parts of the matrix are put into play and they collectively agree what they think would be an increase in the national minimum wage that can uh, help people, but at the same time doesn't damage the, the economy and indeed employment prospects. Because there are issues to consider. Deputy Presiding Officer, at some point, and there will be disagreements uh, within the chamber out where that point is, at some point, there will be a damaging effect on the economy if pay is increased uh, by too much too quickly. Um, the Low Pay Commission reached their view on where that ought to be and the government follows that recommendation, but I accept others will have a different view. I think we have to think carefully about the impact on smaller companies. I think everyone would welcome uh, the comments made by Alex Salmond about the uh, employer presumably within his uh, constituency, but for many other smaller businesses, it is more troubling, it is more difficult, and for some sectors in particular, and John Mason mentioned some of them, there just are tighter margins within those companies, within those businesses. And again, it's a far more difficult objective to achieve. So we welcome the debate. Uh, as I say, I congratulate John Mason again, um, but we part company from him about making it statutory. Thank you. Many thanks. Um, before I call Nigel John, Mr. John, your request to speak request seems to have gone off. Can I just confirm you still want to speak? So thank, thank you, you. Nigel John. Thank, thank you very much. I think I just moved some heavy paperwork and it did the rest for me. I'm uh, grateful for the opportunity to speak and I'm very grateful to John Mason for bringing this debate before us today. Uh, I'm also very grateful to Neil Finlay for representing the Labour Party who otherwise didn't seem to want to even debate their own amendment. Um, and I'm going to address the issues that were in it and explain why they probably didn't want to. But I'd like to start, presiding officer, by considering where Gavin Brown got to, because I listened very carefully to every word he said. He felt that the uh, living wage should be a voluntary code um, because he felt that if we increased wages too quickly, then there would be other effects. Undoubtedly, that's an economic fact. However, I would ask myself why on earth we have a minimum wage in the first place, because nobody seems to dispute that we need one. And the answer is that it sets the norm. And as John Mason has already pointed out, if it's too low, then government actually has to top it up with benefits of one sort or another. And that means, actually, that the government is then subsidising the very inefficient employers who apparently have such poor margins that they can't pay the minimum the, the appropriate minimum wage, which is actually going to be the living wage. So I think Gavin Brown might like to consider the economics of his argument. Quite frankly, presiding officer, we would not be having this debate if the minimum wage was set at something that was recognisably the living wage. It's the fact that it's fallen behind, which is why we're here. The Labour Party has 
argued many times that we missed an opportunity in the Procurement Reform Act of 2014. And I'd like to take the opportunity of just putting it very clearly on the record in the context of today's debate that we did not have an opportunity in the Procurement Reform Act to demand that contractors and businesses pay the minimum wage, sorry, the living wage. That's quite simply because all the legal advice that we got said that they shouldn't. Time does not allow, presiding officer, for me to refer to the response that we got from the European Union. I note that the Local Government and Regeneration Committee SEC report in 2012 on the very issue noted that East Renfrewshire Council, which I think Hugh Henry mentioned in a debate not so very long ago, itself advised it had no preconditions on its tenders and contractors to pay the living wage and added that it would have some unease about such a rule, including concerns over its legality. Even the local councils, which the Labour Party prays in aid of the missed opportunity, actually recognised that we couldn't do it. And I, for one, would be extremely grateful if the Labour Party stopped suggesting that we should. Indeed. Neil Finlay. Mr Don will be aware it all depends on who you ask for that legal opinion and what legal opinion you get, that you get back. No, it's all done. Uh, the legal opinion that you get back is couched in terms which says that it's unlikely that the rules that his party wanted were consistent with European law. When you are advised that something is inconsistent with law, you don't do it. And if I've got half a moment, I would suggest that Mr Finlay goes and looks up... No, no, just a moment. Please listen for a while. Uh, Claycross Urban District Council. I can't, unfortunately, give you my old administrative law casebook. I have thrown it out. I know you never should. If he looks to go and look, cares to go and look it up, he'll discover that councillors have a fiduciary duty, and the wise ones remember that, and they don't do things where their legal advisors tell them that they shouldn't. Neil Finlay. If that's the case, then why press ahead? Um, and you know, I make no comment on the validity of it, but why press ahead with minimum unit pricing then? Nigel Dawn. I think we're very clear that there is a very different legal basis for that, and it's somewhat of a stretch from where we are now. Presiding officer, I'm conscious that my time is gone, and this is a very interesting debate, and there are numerous other things that I, I might have said. I will reimburse you, Mr. Dawn, for your in the interventions. Well, thank you very much. In which case, the last point that I want to make is simply to remind anybody watching, anybody listening, that the Spirit Level, a book, a very recent book by Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett, ought to be compulsory reading for anybody who can read. Because quite simply, it discusses the economic justification for doing everything that we can to remove inequalities, financial inequalities, from a society. And curious though it may seem, and the Tories manifestly do not believe it, it is actually even better for those at the top of the pile as well as those at the bottom of the economic pile. And I would encourage everybody to be familiar with what's in there, and we'll have much better debates as a result. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that now brings us to the end of the open part of the debate, and I now invite Annabel Ewing to respond to it. Minister, if you could do so in around seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I too would congratulate uh, my colleague John Mason on uh, securing this debate uh, this afternoon, and I know that he has a very strong uh, track record of working to tackle poverty and low pay for his constituents in Glasgow. Uh, Shettleston. And I would like to stress at the outset, Presiding Officer, that the Scottish Government takes the issue of low pay very seriously indeed. And moreover, addressing uh, low pay features prominently in the Scottish Government's programme for government, where we do recognise the real difference the living wage makes to the people of Scotland and the real difference, to deal with uh, Mr. one of Mr Brown's points, that progressive employment and social policies make to the long-term success of business and the wider community. And, and I did uh, Alex Salmond uh, uh, helpfully uh, advised us this morning about small business in his constituency in, in New Deer, who has just become a living wage accredited employer. So I, I think it shows the desire on the part of employers across uh, uh, Scotland, small, medium sized, large, to recognise that progressive employment policies are the future for sustainable long term success in business. Uh, as the Chamber will be aware, Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government is leading the way by doing all that we can within the powers that we have to ensure that as many people as possible benefit from the living wage. 
For example, despite very sharp uh, reductions imposed in the Scottish budget by the UK government that we, we heard today the First Minister talking about in First Minister's questions, we have nonetheless been able to incorporate a number of distinct measures within our pay policy to protect the pay of our lowest earning public sector workers, including a commitment to support the Scottish living wage for the duration of this Parliament, the first Scottish Government, in fact, to do so, presiding officer. Of course, absent statutory powers for Scotland over pay and employment law, this commitment of the Scottish Government can only, by definition, cover those workers actually uh, covered by our own pay policy and not the wider public sector or private sector. But at the same time, we are absolutely determined to do what we can to ensure the inequalities of low pay are tackled in Scotland. So, for example, we have provided... Certainly. Alex Salmond. I, I don't know if the Minister is aware of just how serious the situation is with regard to the minimum wage not keeping pace of inflation. Uh, I got some figures from Spice uh, which show us uh, that in two out of the four years from 2007, the minimum wage didn't keep pace of either rate of inflation. Uh, and... Uh, in two years, it kept uh, in f three years after, that's 2011, 2012 and 13, it didn't keep pace with either the CPI or the RPI. Isn't it astonishing that over all of these years, the minimum wage, the statutory minimum wage, didn't even keep pace with inflation? Minister? Um, I thank the member for his intervention. I, I agree. I think it's an absolute d disgrace and uh, it's a, a, a real a kick in the teeth to uh, workers across Scotland and indeed the UK. And, I, and indeed, in, in my research for today's debate, presiding officer, I did note a comment from Michael Meacher on the minimum wage taken from his website on the 5th of November 2012, where he said, uh, Blair appointed a low-pay commission headed by a CBI bigwig in order to ensure it started at far too low a level, £3.60, and it has never been increased at a rate slightly above the rise in average wages as was intended, so that it would grow slowly but steadily towards the two-thirds target. I think in this instance, Michael Meacher sums up the uh, situation uh, very well in terms of Westminster's failure to act in the interests of the workers. Certainly. Neil Finlay. You know, she quoted uh, uh, Michael Meacher there. At least Michael Meacher and Tony Blair turned up to vote for the minimum wage, unlike some people. Minister. Well, I would also say, gently, Mr Finlay, that I am looking at, at a voting record here, and I would helpfully suggest that he might go and look at it himself. It is in Hansard for the time, and uh, I believe Tony Blair missed all four Commons votes. Uh, Jim Murphy missed the vote in second reading. Uh, 33 MPs of 56 uh, missed uh, uh, another vote. So I think uh, Mr Finlay would be... Uh, uh, it would be helpful if he went to look at the Hansard record himself. Presenting officer, the uh, Scottish Government has uh, further uh, added to the funding to the Poverty Alliance promote take-up of the Living Wage Accreditation Initiative and have set a target for at least 150 accredited employers by the end of 2015. And this will indeed help increase the numbers of employers paying the living wage in all sectors across Scotland, helping to make decent pay the standard in our country. As at 30th December 2014, the number accredited has, uh, I would say to John Mason, increased uh, to, I understand, 90 employers, so a bit higher uh, than the figure he had quoted. So we are evidently making good progress in that regard. Uh, although the, the Scottish Government is not able to set pay levels in the private sector or indeed the wider public sector in Scotland, we are doing all we can to encourage all organisations to ensure all staff on lower incomes receive a fair level of pay. Indeed, we have made it clear in our programme for government that we will introduce a Scottish business pledge so that in return for support from the Scottish Government and its agencies such as Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise, we will make it clear that we want companies to commit, amongst other things, to pay the living wage and also to fair work. As far as procurement uh, is concerned, uh, the key problem, as we know, is that power over pay is still held uh, in London. Uh, and indeed, if any of the Westminster... Uh, I'll take a very brief intervention, Mr Brown. Gavin Brown. That deserves an answer. A statutory living wage was rejected in the White Paper. What is the Scottish Government's current position on the issue of a statutory living wage? Minister? Well, I, I think it, it should be noted that, of course, in the White Paper, what we set forth was uh, that we would consider very carefully the uh, recommendations of the expert group uh, on welfare. Uh, and that would be further also to the, the Fair Work Convention uh, that we'd be looking at issues of pay. Uh, and that is certainly in, in terms of what we intend to do with the Fair Work Convention, what we intend to do. I think it's no secret, of course, that the Scottish Government has shown by its deeds that it is indeed very supportive 
uh, of the living wage. And we have tried to go as far as we can within the powers that we currently have to ensure that workers in Scotland get a fair pay uh, for a fair day's uh, work. Uh, but on the issue of procurement, I think it is important to reply to the debate, presiding officer. I, I appreciate I'm going a wee bit beyond time, but I have taken uh, some interventions. Yes, I can uh, confirm that. I can thank you, presiding time. officer. But I think it is important to, to recognise the key problem here, which is that we do not, this Parliament does not have power over pay. That is still held in Westminster. And in terms of the Westminster Unionist parties, that is the position that they wish to see uh, maintained. Of course, the alternative would have been uh, in that regard to ensure that we here in Scotland could get power over pay. But again, uh, the Westminster Unionist parties did not seek that power in the Smith uh, uh, process. Uh, and indeed, the Labour Party would, it appears, rather have a Tory government at Westminster in charge of the pay of Scottish workers rather than a Scottish government here in Scotland. I think uh, as we move to the months ahead with the Westminster election looming, that uh, the voters of Scotland will find that increasingly difficult to understand, presiding officer. Um, in addition to the work we are doing around procurement in terms of statutory uh, guidance, uh, we will also be holding a summit with uh, business leaders to, do, to see what we can do further to uh, ensure that living wage is, uh, uh, the, becomes the norm uh, in terms of pay policy in Scotland. I have referred also to the Fair Work uh, Convention, which we will be setting up further to the Working Together uh, review to look at workforce matters. I had many other things uh, to say today, presiding officer, including on the important issue of the uh, pay gap uh, in terms of female uh, employment. Uh, I hope there will be another opportunity, and if members are listening, I'm always very happy to come to the chamber to speak about the important issues of uh, fair work, fair pay, and gender uh, equality in the workplace. But I would conclude uh, today, presiding officer, by thanking uh, John Mason for bringing this debate, uh, important debate, to the chamber uh, today. Uh, I would say that I believe that the way forward is to ensure that we in Scotland have the pay and employment powers necessary to tackle uh, inequality in Scotland. At the moment, we operate with our hands tied behind our back in that regard. And as I say, I think it will be something that the voters of Scotland in the months ahead will give some thought to as to where they would wish to see these powers lie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Minister. That concludes John Mason's debate on equal pay. And I now suspend this meeting of Parliament until 2.30pm.